Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. It is that time again. It is 11, well, it's 11.03, a little late today. Welcome back to The Pulse. My name is Matt, this is Crypto Heartbeat, and we are back with Stephen Friday. We do this every Friday, and this is our 10th episode. And we do this for two hours on Fridays, and it has become an absolute joy for me. And I think one of the cool things is when you're on a schedule like this, it's really helpful because you're like, hey, it's time to do it again, Steve. And it's kind of a cool discipline in a way because, you know, we generally have a you know handful of viewers live, but recording this and having this out into the world to me is really important because what Steve and I have kind of discovered is that this is a different format. This is a different format. And actually the format is, um, one, it's, I think it's really authentic, but it's, it's very real time, right? We don't have like, Let's have an agenda, and I'm going to write down what I'm going to say, and then you're going to say what you're going to say. And I love that because it's spontaneous. And if you think about who, you know, what is the Spirit of God? What is Jesus in us, if not always with us? So besides the fact that he's ahead of us, he's real time with us. And I think that that's a really important thing for me to communicate to you is that that's what I've discovered, is that this isn't historical Jesus. This isn't dead Jesus. This is moment by moment Jesus. This is alive. This is speaking. This is out front. This is strategic. This is the shepherd. And to me, you know, that's I've experienced that power all throughout my life. That's what's transformed my life. And so the deeper I get into it, the more incredible things I see. And so what am I attempting to do? Share the love. That's it, right? Just trying to do what David Lee told me to do. Share the love. Folks, it's so good to see you. Let's say hello to the folks in the chat, and then we'll bring Steve in for Stephen Friday. Maybe we'll talk some baseball. Yup, Kay, what's going on? Michael Ostell, hey, it's good to see you. I think you're 10 for 10, man. You're batting a 1,000. Good morning, Matt and Steve and the rest of you great friends. I've got my sleeves rolled up and are ready for the shot of the truth. Well, hey, we'll take a shot. We'll take a swing. Oh, yay. What's up, Sam Camp? Number 10. Hey, Sam. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Taryn, good to see you. And Hexy Quinn. Man, it's always good to have Hexy Quinn with us. She's a superstar helping in so many different ways, and she is extremely creative. Thanks for being here, Hexy Quinn. We appreciate it. And, you know, you help the ratio, if you know what I'm saying, a bunch of dudes. Um, my online ghost. Hello, everyone. Texas life. Good to see you. God is good. Isn't that the truth? Jack Handy. I love Pulse. Praise God. I woke up to God's grace. Hexican and Pulse X holder for life. Jesus is alive. Amen to that. And you know what's so cool is I woke up in the bubbles. I saw the bubbles and it was like pulse, pulse, hex, hex, right? Exploding. It was so cool. I shared that on Twitter. Uh, Bobby Hexerod's here. Bobby Hexerod. So good to see you. Um, Crypto Pez. Hey, Matt, looking forward to this. I am too. This is this is going to be fun. Steak and Bake JDB. What's going on? What's up? Um, my son has a healing ministry and is healing Christians with 60,000 followers. Whoo. That's an interesting one. There you go. You know, the healing ministry. Who is the healer? That'd be a good question to ask Steve. Who is the healer? Who heals? Extremist. God bless y'all. All right, let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we're going to bring in Steve Staggs. What's up, Steve? Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Hey, we're here. We're, we're back here and excited to be back here. Once again, huh? Yeah. We, and for folks that don't know, we, we talk about 15 minutes early. And like the reason we were late is I was just so engaged in the conversation we were having. I'm like, 
Oh, okay, I guess we got to share this with everybody. So I think last time we talked, Steve, on the phone, it was like three hours. I looked at my phone. And I was like, it felt like 15 minutes. <laughs> so besides us doing two hours a week, we're doing like six additional hours. And I just appreciate, you know, there's not a whole lot of people that I've run into who are willing to to share that much. And I, I don't sense that it's a burden for you. I sense that it's a joy for you. But I, I really want you to know I appreciate the time that you spent because it's, you know, I feel I'm, I'm getting the most out of all of this stuff. So thank you for that. Well, my pleasure. Thank you, Matt. You bet. You bet. So today we're going to follow up and we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And so it's like earlier on Right Side Up with Steve Staggs, we talked about a question that I asked you, which was, why are we here? Right. And so I'll just kind of frame that once again and let you really go to town on that one is, you know, I'm still struggling with my dad passing away. Right. I, I think about him all the time. It's probably less now, but I, I, I still have issues with that. And, you know, and it makes me ask a lot of different questions and I've lost people I care about, you know, friends and all of that. But my dad was kind of this exclamation point for me. Yeah. And there's some beautiful, wonderful things about it, but also some bitter things about it. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is just it's it's it. He, he told me all the time it was short, but I never believed him because I was a snot nosed kid. And then I just look around and my daughters, you know, you know, it, it's crazy. It's just the time has flown by so fast. And so, you know, it seems like we're here for a reason. Seems like we got a role to play, but it also seems like there is a strategic plan that's in place that is being accomplished. And so help us understand why are we here? Yeah. I mean, that isn't that the fundamental question to every productive action you take? I mean, why am I doing this now? Whether it's an explicit question or whether it's an implied question, uh, we don't do anything um, unless we think it has some value. Now, even even the drug addict, you know, who who's hooked on heroin, uh, the action they take has very significant meaning to them. Mm -hmm. So there is a purpose behind it. So we understand that as individuals, we understand purpose. As a matter of fact, we understand it so well that if we don't have purpose or we have a sense of loss of that purpose, then we feel lost. We're, we start searching, why, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Man, this seems like the biggest flipping waste of time. What am I doing? See, so, so innately, we understand this whole di dynamic of purpose, and we understand it so thoroughly and significantly that when we don't have it, we start searching for it. And so it's fascinating to me that going back to our very first session about this whole strategic way of thinking, that we are taught to think in terms of events. We are event oriented. We are trained to be event oriented. We deal with events and we start sizing up events. We start making decisions based on our events. Never realizing that when we are event oriented, then we become circum circumstantial in the way we make our decisions. And so circumstances end up dictating the decisions that we make. And so we, the net result is we end up reacting to circumstances. Never thinking that the one who reacts is acting second to the one who first acts. So what actually happens is we are following, we become followers of circumstances while all the time thinking we're dealing with them. Huh. Wow. Wow. If that is not the definition of upside down. And so here we are. Let's, Lord, let's try to get right side up on this thing. How do you deal with circumstances? How do you deal with situations? Oh, I deal with them based on purpose. Huh. 
Well, what is your purpose, Lord Jesus? Steve, I have one purpose, and that's fulfilling my father's vision for why he created. You want to know why? what I do, what I'm doing, what I always have done, what I always will be doing? Yeah, Lord, I really would. I'm performing my role in fulfilling my father's vision. That's what gives purpose to everything in creation. You don't understand that. You don't understand the creation. And so you'll just wonder. Oh, wow. That's what the liar is called. The thief, the, you know, the serpent, the one who causes the entire world to wander into error. That's how the Apostle Paul, excuse me, the Apostle John described the devil, the serpent, Satan, um, in, in the book of Revelation, as the one who causes the entire world to wander into error. Well, if that's the case, if that's what he's doing, what are you doing, Jesus? Well, why do you think they call me the light? Why do you think they call me the truth? Why do you then think I am called life? Because when you get out of error and into the truth of my father's vision for why he created, all of a sudden light and life begin to explode in your life. And now you begin to see purpose not only for the creation, but your role in it. Wow. So thinking strategically, if you were the one who is trying to keep us from doing that, to keep us wandering into error, what would you do? Wouldn't you distract? Wouldn't you distort? Wouldn't you redefine? Wouldn't you misdirect divine purpose? Wouldn't you do everything in your power to hide and shield the Father's vision for creating? Well, I think that's a pretty simple answer to that question. Well, of course. And that's kind of where we left off where we were starting last week is if we want to know who we are, so that we can then begin to learn why we are, then you have to start thinking strategically or at least be willing to start learning how to think strategically in the way Jesus thinks it, not so we can become some big strategic whiz, but because we can, so that we can start understanding what is happening in this interplay that we are watching being played out right in front of us that, oh, by the way, every generation since Adam has watched play out. Right from the beginning, you mentioned Eve and the serpent, right from the beginning of Eve and the serpent, then from Eve and the serpent to Eve and Adam, who was with her. Oh, from Adam and Eve, who then begat their first children that we're aware of, to Cain and Abel, and what do we see? We see that same dynamic happening between Cain and Abel. And the entire story of, the, of life on the planet has been this engagement interplay between wandering into error and Jesus reaching out and saying, hey, you want to see something different? You want to see how this really looks? Well, yes, I do. Well, okay, then let's start from the beginning. And that's what we were doing last week. We were looking at from the very beginning, the second Hebrew word, which is actually the fourth in almost every translation, is Elohim. And, the, and virtually every translation takes its lead from the, King, from the King James Version, which says, in the beginning, God. Well, if we want to know who we are, and by the way, this is not me telling you, you know, how this is, I'm describing how Jesus unlocked it for me. Okay, and now I'm passing it on, it on to you, which then I invite you to do the same thing. Go find out from him the rest of your story in this. But here's something, a starting place for, for you. In the beginning, God, 
Well, we, we talked about last week that the words in the beginning, those are three English words that translate one Hebrew word. And that's the nature of translation because you're attempting to convey the concept and the idea uh, that's being conveyed in the word, not just give a one for one, oh, that word is this word. I mean, that's not how language works. You go to a dictionary and you want to know the definition of a word, how many times does it give you one word? Never. Never. Because it's language is designed to, com to convey, to transfer thoughts, feelings, ideas in an imperfect manner. Um, and so it takes, you know, different words take a lot of different, different languages take a different number of words in order to convey that. So we talked last week, we began with, in the beginning, if you look at the definitions of that, and you showed it, in, you put it on the screen to demonstrate that, in the chief beginning of time, order, and rank. So right from the very get-go, there is an order, a structure, a hierarchy. There is all of this. There is a purpose of time. In those in that one Hebrew word that is described in those several English words, we could spend a half dozen of these episodes just dealing with that one Hebrew word and the ideas it's trying to convey. And then it said, God. That was the English word that was used to translate the word Elohim. And Elohim that we talked about is this is a plural word. So if we were to be honest and how in the translation, it would say in the beginning, the gods created. Well, man, that just, that just blows all over us. Well, we can't do that. So let's change what that word means and make it a singular word. Well, if God wanted it to be singular, then what is it? I mean, if we say that the scriptures are inspired by God and there, there's all kinds of, you know, Christian theology around this, right? That the, that the Bible is inerrant, that it is infallible. Well, if it's inerrant, then why in the world do we need to screw with it by putting a singular word as a direct translation of a plural word? It doesn't work. But what it does indicate is right from the get-go, from the second Hebrew word or the fourth English word, we now have the game. The game is now afoot. And where we left off was the issue is not Elohim. The issue is the assignment of the English word God to that Hebrew word Elohim. Because it doesn't even make sense if you even stop to think about it. You asked me last week about who, you know, what is God to me? I shared with you how Jesus asked me that question. What is God to you? It's the first. It's the only. Well, in our language, when you say God, you're speaking of the supreme being. Well, if we're talking about the supreme being, the one from whom all things that exist came, came from, the first who was preceded by none but succeeded by all, then guess what? You can't have more than one of them. So by putting an S at the end of God, you're creating a category of being that does not exist. No. No. I wonder if God knew that when he had Moses write those words. Well, I think so. So if we're going to understand us, the first thing we have to understand is that there is a, a massive strategic effort to keep us from understanding who we are that begins with changing the second Hebrew word, the fourth English word. So let's start there by understanding that. So now that's that's kind of a in what was it five minutes or so or seven minutes? 
that's kind of a summation of what we were talking about last week. So with that as a kind of a, a launching point, and thanks for you know the patience to let us kind of get caught up with where we where we were. This word Elohim is we're then told in this in the chief beginning of time, order, and rank, the Elohim were assigned the role of of um, forming, shaping, and fashioning his heavens and his earth. And so the, um, and we then translate the Hebrew word that means um, form, fashion, and shape into the English word created. Okay? So that's the word that, you know, that we speak of. And what you and I were talking about the other day is this word created carries with it as its fundamental meaning, choosing. There is a choice that precedes the action, which is really significant. So, so when the Elohim were charged with actually performing the work of creating, bringing things about, they were actually manifesting the choice that the father made, that the first made, um, that was part of his design to fulfill his vision for creating. So he chose. Now, last week you made reference a couple of times to the Hebrew, uh, the, the statement in the book of Hebrews that it's that by faith we understand and that it is impossible to please God apart from faith. Well, why? Well, in, in this strategic engagement, we're taught, religious engagement, we're taught that faith is what we believe. And then that is reinforced by assigning a religious belief system as a form of faith. So we have the Baptist faith, the Catholic faith, the Mormon faith, whatever kind of religious belief system is in play, we then assign are taught that that constitutes a faith. But that is what faith is to the kingdom of God. We talked about this a couple of, a few sessions back, that faith is the very power of God that he inserts and that is resonant within anything and everything he speaks. So before God speaks to us, he chooses what he's going to say. He then speaks it and resonant within those words is his power to bring about the very thing he speaks to us. That's an, that is an expression of his choice. And so creation, creating begins there. So it's impossible to please, please God without faith because otherwise we're doing our own thing. Yeah. That's why it's impossible to please him. By the way, it's the same reason why it's impossible to understand what he's doing apart from what he says, apart from his faith, because apart from what he's speaking to us, we have no capacity for understanding what the heck he's doing. So all of these things are interconnected. And so from a strategic standpoint, it is the design of it all is to distort the simplicity of what God has been saying from the very beginning. And what he said from the very beginning is I have this class of beings called Elohim, whom I've given charge to actually produce what I have chosen to create. Oh, well, who are these Elohim? Who in the world are they? If, you know, we're told through the, our religious system, it's God, but hey, that doesn't even hold any water. If we actually step back and look at it honestly, that would have to be God's. If, we, if English word is actually the right word, then that would have to be God's. In the beginning, the God's. Well, no, that is, that is a contradiction of terms. See, there's no such thing as multiple God's. Not in the way that the English language describes that 
as the, as God being supreme. You can't have multiple supremes. There's only one supreme. Now, there's we can get a very long discussion about all the intellectual and religious gymnastics that we play to try to overcome that that simple uh, statement. But for now, who are those? Who are the Elohim? Well, part two. In Genesis 4-2, we are given, excuse me, Genesis 2-4. I'm sorry, I think I said that backwards. And you can pull it up there. We are given the name of the very first name of an Elohim. Now you're going to see the exact same dynamic in play that I just described with the with the application of God being used to translate Elohim. Same exact dynamic. Um, and in and in in this, the way that it's just the way that it's changed is that. We see this term, Lord God. Uh, now, can you pull up one of the, you know, one of your favorite Bible translations so folks can, can see that, and then we can kind of go back to these or even go to the. Sure. All right, so let's, yeah, let's go to this one first. Okay. This is going to end up turning into a little bit of a Bible study. It's not what we're intending to do, but it's really significant that we get this. Okay. See verse four. What translation? Okay. This is the the NIV. NIV. Yeah. Okay. Is that right? No, that's three. Hang on one second. Let me go back. Isn't that funny? You went back. So Genesis two, four. Yes. All right, here we go. When I zoomed in, it moved. All right, here we go. Two, four, right there. Okay. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the heaven and the the earth and the heavens. So here we are now told, Moses tells us in restating the story, you know, from Jehovah, is telling us that the one who, who managed, if you will, or directed this entire engagement was one identified as Lord God. Okay. Now you notice that Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And you will see that throughout the Old Testament. And I would venture to say that most everyone on this stream or whoever, whomever, is willing to watch these kinds of streams, their primary way of referring to Jesus as Lord, their primary way of referring to the Father is Lord. That Lord is the number one way that we refer to the divine. Probably only equal to that would be God. All right? And when we think of God, we're thinking back to in the beginning God, which is a misnomer. Okay, so who is this Lord God? Well, the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D throughout the entire Old Testament is actually the word Yehovah. Y-H-V-H. We call him Yahweh sometimes. Sometimes we call him Jehovah. You know, but... The, the actual word, if you, if you were to go into, um, into the actual Strong's right there, 3068, okay, yeah, there it is right there, Y-H-V-H. That's what it is right there, okay? So that's the Hebrew, that's the English way of, of writing the Hebrew um, Yehovah. Okay, so now go back. Now, why is that important? Well, apparently Yehovah thought it was okay for him to use his name. Um, 
He's done it about 6,800 times in the Old Testament. And yet in every single instance, it is changed from his name to the title Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Well, hmm. What is the strategic reason for changing a proper name to a title? Authority. Ah. Can there be more capital H, capital, capital Y, capital H, capital V, capital H? H. In other words, can there be more Matt Frazier's? Theoretically. Okay. We take the DNA, the unique person who's given the name Matt Frazier. Can there be more than one of you? Well, no. No. But there can be a lot of Matt Frazier, president of a particular company. That's kind of what you were alluding to a few yeah. minutes ago. There can be a lot of beings with the stamped with the name Matt Frazier. But when you take the being who is given the name Matt Frazier, there can only be one. So by assigning a title, you can add a bunch of lords to the one who possesses the name Jehovah. Instantly, it becomes a distraction, very similar, but in reverse manner to the Elohim statement. The next, st the next thing, and we're almost there to try to set this, this stage up. The next word that you see there is God. What is it? What is it translating? Elohim. Ah, so if you were actually to, to translate that, when you say Lord God, do you know who you're actually speaking about? As compared to Jehovah of the Elohim. That's, this is like massive. Okay. So who was it that actually directed the creation it was Jehovah of the Elohim. And if you go further, what you'll see is this Jehovah of the Elohim is also given the, given the title. Now we're back to title, Lord. Adonai, which means Lord. Isn't it interesting that the way they change that is by capitalizing all the, all the, the letters? But there's actually a Hebrew word that can be used to, that speaks of Lord. And that's Adonai. And it's spelled a couple of different, couple of different ways. And when you see that term translated, they'll have either a lowercase L-O-R-D all the way across or a capital L with lowercase O-R-D there. Now, by the way, there's all kinds of justification for this mental gymnastics, but the strategic essence of it is, is it hides who actually created mm. what his role and category is that there is one Jehovah who is of the Elohim who directed the entirety of this creation. And as time goes on through the new, through the old Testament, excuse me, this Jehovah is further described as the Lord who is the most high, El Yon, of the Elohim. So when you think of Jehovah, the one who did this, directed all this, this, the creation, who actually was charged by the Father, that's who Jesus called by the Father, very much, that's exactly right, Jack. It's exactly right. It's called redefinition, by the way. If I redefine a term and you accept that term, guess who's in charge of your thinking? The one who redefined it. Term. Yeah. See? So that's why we're all constantly advocating, going back and saying, well, okay, Jesus, how do you see this? What did you have in mind when you had this written? What were you thinking about? Why? Because we want to think how he thinks. Yep. We want him to teach us how to think how he thinks. See? We want him to be the authority over the way that we think. 
See, so very, very practical. Well, and so, everything stems from this. It's how it works. It's how this is part of the time, order, and rank of the creation. See, how did he? How did he create? How did he bring from the intangible thought into the tangible reality? He spoke. So guess what? If somebody wants to distort the way we think, how are they going to do it? They're going to speak to us. Mm. And they're going to speak, they're going to speak, speak a perverse, a perversion of what is true if their intention is to control us. Well, we see that in culture, I mean, daily. Now, I mean, Jesus how, said, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go, go. Yeah. What, what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? If you abide in my word, see, then you will come to know the truth and the truth will set you free. Why? Yeah. Because you're abiding in his word. And you're not, and he, what he will do is strip away all of this redefinition that we've been trained to think about that completely distorts not only the purpose for the creation, but more, but e of equal importance, distorts who we are. All right. So you're kind of getting this set up. We're now finishing yeah. the setup here. Yeah, and I think it's really important because I'm watching the chat. Let me let me say it back to you, Steve, because yeah. I want to make sure I've got it right. And I think that I may represent some of what I see in the chat as well. Okay. I mean, this is enormous, right? It, it's absolutely tremendous, but I want to I want to make sure I'm getting it right so that the original the original Hebrew is saying Elohim, and we recognize that there can only be one supreme. Okay, so I think we we recognize there's only one God. Okay, so let's just let's just put that aside and say God is the Creator, the supreme. And Jesus called him Father. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. So that's where we're that's what we're saying right now. When we look into this, the English translation took something that was not God supreme and inserted it for this out of some reason it has been a distraction, right? And and really gotten us off course. It's st we're starting in the wrong place. Yes. And so what I hear you saying is, and what it makes sense and resonates with me, is, all right, if we actually break this down and we say, okay, in the beginning, right, the Elohim, right? So if we if we look at this, and then, of course, what you just said in, in Genesis 2-4, we're taking a, a number of terms that have different meanings and we're lumping them into one and assigning them as the same and it's causing confusion. And obviously this is kind of the role of the, the enemy, right? To lie to us, to confuse us, to distort things. What is incredible about this, and I think this is important to say, because Hornet UK said this, even if other beings had or had in creating us, Maybe it was still the will of God. Now, I think it's really important to define this. So I'm going to try it, and then, Steve, I want you to try it, too. Yes. So what I think actually what we're saying here is, because that's that was my confusion last week, right? I was like, well, what did, like, 30 people make us, man? No, no, hang on. The divine, the purpose and order and rank, basically the reason that the Father created by speaking it into existence, he assigned this creative ability to a class of beings, okay, of which we are one. Yes. What is amazing about this, though, but then he gave a name to who this was in Genesis 2-4. This one is what we call Yahweh of the Elohim, right? So this, and it's defined that way, then that's what's, I think, the big, like, aha moment here is, we're not saying that there are many gods because that's impossible to have. You can't have many gods. You can have one. So the father that Jesus spoke to is the father, the almighty, the one singular God. But it looks like in all that I read in the scriptures, there's all kinds of different tasks and responsibilities for those that he created. And one of the first things he decided to do in the very beginning is to assign 
creation. Well, one of the things amazing about the scriptures is it speaks of Jesus. It says all things were created for him and by him. So what I take away from this is that Yahweh of the Elohim is Jesus. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So when we say, we're not saying, oh yeah, it was like this God and that God and the God of the sun and the moon and the stars and all. No, no, no. The firstborn, right? The one that Jesus or that Jesus himself defined in Genesis 2, 4, who created, which is reinforced later in scriptures, is the one who has given the authority. All things were created for him and by him, and he is Yahweh of the Elohim. And what's amazing about that is, as I then see my own journey in that, Steve, what has he said to me? He said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. He says to me also, do not, so do not lean on your own understandings. That's me going my own way. Like, I think I got it figured out, Steve. I'll lean on my own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge me and I will make your path straight. Right? So if he's overcome the world, that these things are, the world is the distraction, the self, all of these things are this distraction. But if you stay connected to me and understand my purpose in creation, and you listen, I mean, how many times, right? Yeah. Peter, James, and John go up the Mount of Transfiguration, and it's like, this is my son, listen to him. Spirit of God comes, he's like, no, no, he doesn't speak on his own, he only does what he hears, and he's reminding you of everything I told you. So he's even helping you listen to Jesus. Yeah. But when you really define this, you're like, hold on a second. This actually gives me purpose. And why does it actually give me purpose is because I am in the rank and the order of this because of the definition of who he says I am in him. If Jesus is the one that was given this authority all the way through from the very beginning, and then he wants to say to me, and you, Steve, Hey, you are sons. Here is a ring. Here is authority. What did he ask us to do to rule? Yep. And you go, okay, so we can't do anything. So if Jesus said, I only do what the Father tells me to do, then everything else that is related to the distractions of life is like what I kind of take from this, the practical application for myself is, it's like I shouldn't do anything unless he tells me to do it. Like I, I really, like I should like, literally hold every single thought captive and go, Jesus, what do you want me to do? I'm making a list. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? Because if he has this in creation design of hierarchy of purpose, he started with the very purpose that he gave to Yahweh of the Elohim, which yeah. is to create. And then he's giving that authority to us to do the same. And you know what? It blows my mind, Steve, and this is where I'll stop. You're doing good. Keep it up, bro. Dude, the so people probably know the double slit experiment, right? You know about Schrodinger's cat in physics. They talk about how when the waveform. This is the whole basis of quantum computing, and it's the spooky action at a distance. It's this thing we don't understand. Is that when we push photons through a double slit and we don't observe it, it creates a waveform, and we see an interference pattern on the back wall. But as soon as we, as the creation, those that are of the Elohim, observe that photon, it collapses into a particle. The very observation of the creation and authority that we we're given at its smallest point transforms the creation. And that what you see, and this is the thing that's interesting. If you put my dog in the room, my dog doesn't know what is observing. My dog cannot collapse the waveform. Yeah. Now, there are some things. My dog could bump the mechanism and mess it up. But the observation is only the difference of us between the animals. Our ability to collapse a waveform is actually the inherent evidence of the authority to rule. 
Because actual creation changes through the observation that was given to us, which is ultimately the gift that defines the difference of us and the animals. And when you ultimately understand that we are, he's the firstborn, he's the creator, all things are created for him and by him, and that we are sons of his, there's evidence that it is true that defines the class. But upside down has everything backwards. That's all I have to say. No, that... By the way, folks, once again, we kind of make reference to this um, throughout our various streams. This is what our conversations look like on the phone together, okay? And what, and what you're describing is you're describing a, a capability that not all beings possess. Um, and we observe it every day. We just don't know what it is we're observing. And that's by design. Because if we ever get who we are, back to your question, well, Steve, who are we? Yep. You know, we've forgotten who we are. Who are we? Well, okay, let's spend a little, a few minutes. Let's get our heads twisted just a bit in the way of getting them then untwisted. And just look at this thing very simply. Let the words speak by themselves. Elohim is a plural word. On what basis do we assign not only a singular word, but a supreme being to that plural word? That doesn't even make sense. See, well, and, and, and that's and not drill, even honest. It, it isn't. And, and let's let's kind of extrapolate that. So when you know, I watch the History Channel or I watch a lot of these things about the stories and mythologies and all this stuff, we're really loose in our language with the term God, right? And of course, you know, Moses goes up to the mountain, right? He comes down, they built a golden calf. There's so many stories of people building things that are representations and worshiping before something that is inanimate. You know, they cut it from wood or they build these, these representations. And of course, we see this in the East a lot, right? And we see this of all these different gods. Well, this is the God of this, and this is the God of the water and the wind and the waves. And, you know, we have all these things. We kind of, I think, loosely say, well, that's a lowercase God. Well, what are we using that loose term for? We're saying, well, this is this seems different than us. I don't have that ability that like Zeus had or like, uh, you know, the king, uh, the Atlanteans or whatever it may be. And I feel like our cultural view of the term gods and what actually is referred to there is, hold on, no, this is the, and especially if you think about it systematically, it's very, very clear as you review the Old Testament that there is one God. And so you cannot replace it with another term and it be equal. It's impossible, especially in the context of all of it. It just doesn't work. Well, yeah, that's right. And, and so, you know, if we kind of, connect some of these dots just a little bit. We see that there are Elohim, whomever they are, who were assigned the role of actually materializing, you know, building the Chevy, if you will. There's a designer in the back who's got, you know, who designed the Chevy, the engineers who put it all together. And then there was a group that was assigned to, to be out in the factory to build the thing. Yep. Okay, that's kind of a simple, a simple way of describing it. And then there is one who we're, we're, we are told the name of one, that's Genesis 2, 4, who is part of the Elohim. His name is Jehovah or Yahweh or Jehovah. Those are all ways that we describe this one whose name is YHVH. And this one is of the Elohim. And this one of the Elohim is the one who actually did the creation of this. By the way, that's what Jesus was describing to John, who then referred to it as the word in John 1. If we want to go there at some, you know, in some session. 
it just blows your mind how that all comes yeah. together. Okay. And so this is, this is simple stuff when you understand, when you get out of the religious distortion, this wandering into error is very simple stuff. When you step back into, well, of course. So, okay. So here's a question that comes in the chat. And I appreciate the fact that y'all are so engaged with this. I know <laughs> yeah. we don't have a whole lot of people watching, but your engagement is really good. Yeah, so here's awesome. the thing. In, in Hornet UK one, I this is exactly where I had been too, because I feel like, you know, it, it, let me tell you a, a, a short story that illustrates this. So I'm in Central Texas, and I was going to a Bible church, and this is years ago. Okay, the pastor, one of the most wonderful people I've ever met, he's passed away, and he was like the quintessential pastor. He knew everybody's name, he knew kids' names, he and, and over forty years. He would, you'd see him in the grocery store. That, I can't believe that man actually went to the grocery store because he knew everybody and knew everything about them and paid attention to everything. And just everyone loved him. And he was so kind, caring, considerate, thoughtful, amazing man. And he brought in a guy that he really respected as his assistant pastor. Well, this guy was from England and he had studied at, you know, Oxford and he was a smart cookie. Okay. Well, his thing was really interested in, um, he was an apologist for essentially atheism, you know, atheists. He was really, really well read. And here we are in central Texas and the people that this pastor had gathered were regular folks. Okay. Regular folks, kind of down home central Texas folks. And here's this guy who speaks with an accent and starts talking about things that are cosmological, right? He starts, the analogies he uses, the words that he uses, the comparison that he uses are everything from space to physics to all this. So what did Crypto Harpy do? I'm like, you had me at hello. So he was describing, I'm like, wow. <laughs> Nobody liked him to the point where people would go into the pastor's office and criticize this guy because it wasn't the style they liked. Okay, they ran him out on a rail. Yeah. And here's the amazing thing about that is that, you know, obviously, if I'm talking to a child, I talk differently than if I'm talking to you, Steve, my 12 year old son, I change my language for him. And if he asks more probing questions, I give him more information. But I kind of am sensitive to the fact of what can he handle? And so what I found is that, you know, when I was kind of coming up in the church and going through discipleship, it was like, hey, let's get the big rocks to find. And so a lot of what I feel like the local church was doing, especially in my area, was just saying, hey, got a lot of people that don't even know that there is a God. Right. So let me just kind of get you warmed up to the idea. Right. This is intro God 101. Well, in that, it propagates this story and no one has the patience. Hey, we're, we're trying to get to lunch, Steve. What are you taking so much time? Why, why are you using these crazy analogies, right? And I think a lot of people are doing that with what we're saying, too. Is they're saying in, there's a certain group of people who, because of what they have been purposed and, and designed to do, are attracted to the depths of this. I'm one of those people. But there are people I know very, very well who have zero patience for what we're talking about, even if it's true. It's not that they don't love God. It's, they have zero patience. And then I think about the newborn baby who doesn't speak English. And so this is a discussion for people when it's the right time. So to answer this question with Hornet UK and just to address this stuff, I was told that too. But you know what's funny is the, the answers, you know, the people that are sharing, you know, trying to do their best to share the gospel and trying to do their best to manage a group of people within a church, there's much, much more emphasis on the general lowest common denominator of, hey, let's kind of get the big rocks together here, even if they are off base in some respects. But when you drill into them, and there's so many stories of people who have drilled into the Hebrew and literally, some of them literally lost their minds. They it, like literally just drove them off the edge. Why? Because this is a really, really deep well. And so 
what people will do is they, they don't want to go into this detail or they don't know this detail. So what do they say? Yeah, well, that Elohim, yeah, it's plural. That means the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. What Steve's talking about, and, and this is really not for us to say, believe us, right? I'm coming to this understanding, but what do I do? I ask Jesus myself, is this right? The Steve guy's talking about the Elohim. He's saying, well, no, it's, you know, you're the creator, God. And, you know, Jesus is obviously this firstborn son. And hold on, he is the Yahweh of the Elohim, and he is of this class, and he's the, the top dog. But then he says we're sons, and then it's like, hold on a second. There is some bit of a mystery in all of this, but it's defining this rank and order. And if you're not willing to go the distance to understand what the rank and order is, then it really has no value and meaning to you, and you just kind of go about your day just assuming that it's all lumped into one. The power in all of this, and I think what is kind of the unlocking and the refreshing part of this is, don't we want it to line up and make sense and be, and it to resonate? Because I feel like the more I understand how it aligns with the purpose of creation and the vision of God, the more it rings, the more impact it has, the more it opens up, and the more fruit is produced that makes sense so almost like well i don't have the time to tell you all this stuff so i'll just tell you it's the trinity that's not what we're saying is that fair that's very fair and it's a and it's a very fair question um virtually anybody who who has spent any time trying trying to understand this will all come up come about very <laughs> i just had to put that up for you steve yeah. i'm like born at uk is like reading our mail yeah two, two hours and 45 minutes the other day yeah that's we spent it all on that UK. <laughs> you, you, you he was he was uh peeking into our conversation yeah we'll have to include him next time yes yes yeah, that'll be fun um but what happens for all of us is we I've been taught to draw certain prescribed conclusions when we hear, hear certain things. You just described what happened with, you know, people in your church when this guy came in and started using a different vocabulary and yep. started connecting it to other parts of the creation. They ran them out. Why? because they were trained to think in a particular way. And that training created a line of defense that became impenetrable. Yeah. Because that line of defense not only wasn't just about defending how they thought about things, but how they thought about things was the very basis for their eternal security, yeah. their eternal safety their ability to be acceptable to God. And so when I'm now going to go back to our several, you know, the number of times we've talked strategically, well, who does that benefit? If we are told certain things that we are, that a particular conclusion is prescribed, then who then becomes the prescriber of the way we think. Well, the one who created that idea or that concept or that doctrine and theological or theology or whatever it is, there is a belief system in place that predetermines what we will are willing to hear and what we're not willing to hear. Well, the moment that, and the moment that, realization came to me, I said, time out. Uh, God is the one who said, hey, you got a question, come to me, I'll answer you. And not only will I, will I answer you, I am attentive to your very question. So what he said to Jeremiah, he said to Jerry, Jerry, tell my boys, here's how it is. You got a question, ask me, I'm ready to answer. And I'm attentive. And when they ask, what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow the drawers off. Yep. I'm going to set something right in front of them, right in front of them. They're going to look at it, things that have been hidden from them that they did not know. But when they come to know them, boy, why? Because I want you to know why I created. 
I'm inviting you into this. You're players. Yep. Come on. You we have need a role. To how to play. So, you know, now let's, so we're kind of getting, you know, getting where we're going here. So now let's go. So now what we've seen, we've seen Elohim. We kind of beat that horse. Now we've seen that they're one identified among the Elohim, whose name is Jehovah, that later on is described as the, as the Lord most high of the Elohim. Okay. And these Elohim were charged with the, um, with the both the authority and prerogative to actually manifest what the Father had in his heart and, and mind and desire to create. Okay. And Jehovah was the top dog. He was the guy who was in charge of building it all. We can then go into John 1 1 and take a picture, you know, take a peek of how he described it to John to describe to us. And it's quite profound. All right. So now we have the Elohim. They're creating. We now have the one who is Jehovah, who is top, you know, who is the, the uh, most high of the Elohim, who's directed this whole event. Now let's look. So now we see what the Elohim look like. Now, for brevity's sake, the Elohim, what characterizes, there are certain things that characterize the Elohim. Um, chief among them is the prerogative to rule and to create in this, in this dimension of forming, fashioning, and shaping um, with the Father, to bring about his manifested, to manifest his vision for why he's creating, okay? That's the Elohim. The Elohim are a class of beings, okay? They're not a singular being, like we're told, God. It's a class of beings. Now, how do we know that, okay? Now, let's look at man, okay? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. If you can pick out one of your things so we can have folks look at what we're it's typically described how it's typically described. Genesis 126. Yeah, 126 and 27. Yeah. Okay. And do you want do you want um Hebrew? Yes. Okay. I mean, get get whatever your favorite translation is so they can look at it generally so they have a Point of reference. Okay, well, let me go back then. Okay. All right, this is 126, 27. Now, once again, we have then God said. That word God, guess what that word God is? Elohim. Elohim, yes. Then the Elohim said, what is Elohim? It's a plural word. So these guys are, are conferring. They're all speaking together. Say, so this group of Elohim are saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here, here is this rulership dimension. Okay, now let us make man in our image. And, and our likeness, this word image and likeness, these are both uh, du um, duplicate kinds of words. They speak of um, a duplicate being made from an original. In, in, the, in the context, without going in too deep into this, image relates more to the outward expression of the duplicate. This is what we might call the uh, the the, um, the capabilities. So the Elohim could talk. That's what they're saying. They said they could talk. They could walk. They could move. They could hear. They could create. They could rule. See, there are certain capabilities. So guess what? We can see that. See, man is. 
is built with these capabilities. See, we can see, we can think, we can reason, we can talk, we can do all of these things, these, these external kinds of capabilities. And then there is, and to our likeness. Once again, isn't it fascinating we have this plural term? See, these are plurals. To coincide with what? Huh, the, pro, the plural Elohim. Now, the way the Christian doctrine deals with that is back to, you know, UK's question. It's to make, it's to say, well, this is speaking in the, in the pre-New Testament era of the Trinity. Eh, okay. I suppose that's one way you can look at it. Certainly the way I used to look at it. Um, we can get into that at another time. But what we see is we see the Elohim saying, now what's going to happen is we're going to, to create man in our image and in our likeness. And we're giving man all of, this, all of these capabilities, both in terms of how they can function, as well as in terms of their assigned role, which is to rule the earth and everything that's on the, on the earth. Okay? Now, then you go into, so now we see what, what that is. So now let's see how the Elohim actually did that. Okay, so now go to Genesis 128. And tell me if you want a different version of this. This is the this is aligned with the Hebrew as well. Yes, this is the this is the format I I, I use most often because it gives me kind of a parallel. And you can see in each of these columns, you can see the Strong's that you can refer to to go to the specific definition. Then you see the Hebrew word. You see the English, uh, some of the English words that are used to translate that. And then you see the, the, the grammatical elements on the far right column. For the nerdies out there, you know, this is kind of a fun thing to get in to get get into. But what you said, what you see here is you see how you really can't make a one for one, you know, connection to these, but it says, and bless them, God, on this is on the third column. God. Now, once again, and blessed them, God. What is God? Elohim. Elohim. And said to them, Elohim. Elohim, be fruitful. So if you were to, if you were to be, so there's a, what the normal translations say, and God blessed them, and God said to them. Yep. That's kind of weird. See, in English, what I would what I would actually say, and if I were to use that, and God's and God uh, blessed them and said to them, why would I repeat that? So, if you actually go in, if you go into this and look at it, and by the way, you can't escape this once you look at it. Yeah. When you go in and you actually look at these definitions on the left side, on the very first column, uh -huh. these words, and you start doing like we did on the first ones, man, it's it's almost impossible to get away from. And the Elohim blessed them and said, Elohim, be fruitful and multiply. And some of us say, yeah, you're kind of jockeying around that. Well, my question is, is the very question Jesus, at, you know, you know, challenged me with. Well, what do you think it means to be in my image and likeness? If you're in my image and likeness, aren't you like me? See, if the Elohim created you, what are you? You're an Elohim. Yep. See? Now, why is it important that we, now we're going back to this wandering into error thing? Why is it important for us to be totally blinded to the simplicity that we 
are of the Elohim class. Why are there so many offenses created? Oh my goodness, now I'm starting to get it. The reason for assigning the word, English word God to Elohim is not just to distort us from the Elohim, but more importantly, to keep us from recognizing who we are in our place and, and order and rank within God's creation. Yep. We are among the Elohim. We are the ones whom God has created to rule with him, to create with him, to do all the things that he desires us to do with him. Oh my goodness. Yep. Your vision. You are describing to us your vision that we would rule your creation with you in the fullness of your nature and character. Wow. That is who we are. Got it. Boom, drop the mic. Drop the mic, Steve. I never knew that. It is, and it's profound, folks. Like, when I came to understand this, like, this is like, it not only blows your mind, but you you start to, everything kind of becomes simple in the sense that it becomes ordered. Because I feel like it was in disorder. And when I came to understand this through my own seeking of the Lord's confirmation, is things became ordered. And of course, what are the, what's the fruit of the Spirit in this, right? This... Well, yeah, it all lines up and is ordered. And then it illustrates in everything now how things are upside down. Because everything, it's almost like part and parcel of, of the distraction and of the distortion. And you see it. like that. This is really what has opened my eyes to see the plans of those who are trying to lie. Well, we go back to the garden. It's like, it's the same thing over and over and over again. It's a yeah. lie and a distortion of the truth. What's, fasc what's fascinating, Matt, when you go back to the garden, what the serpent was doing as the agent of, of Satan, that's the, you know, that's the one that we would recognize there, is he promised her something that she already was. Yeah. You're not going to die. Instead, the Elohim knows that you're going to become like the Elohim. Well, of course he does. See? You're already an Elohim. See? You, you're missing. So right from the beginning, you see this distortion beginning to happen in the exchange between the serpent and Eve. That is then that same distortion, distraction, misdirection is happening in the scriptures that are telling the story. In the translation. In the translations. The scriptures themselves are plain. Yeah. They're, it could not be simpler. So the big story, in, in uh, I, I feel like I always have to make it, like, you kind of have to make it your own in the sense of, all right, do I have this right? The implications of this, Steve, are so tremendous because now, like I said, everything gets ordered. And so let me just attempt this. You know, I talk a lot about how the fact that well, the world is saying that you're the descendant of a monkey, yep. right? You're this billions and billions of years ago. You evolved out of this ooze and turned into Steve. And of course, I obviously push back at that. So if you start at that, well, the upside down world says you are... I mean, I think they're saying you're lower than the animals, but yep. at minimum, you are an animal. Okay? okay. So let's think about this. That's the world's telling us right now is you're an animal. I mean, I listen to all kinds of things on physics. I love this stuff. 
I'd love to get into the quantum, but everybody's talking about evolution and everyone's talking about how you just bumped in, you know, molecules bumped into each other and here you are. Well, no wonder if I can convince you that you don't have any value. So when I, you know, swat the fly in the house, I might as well get swatted myself because I'm no different than the fly because that's what I've been told literally all my life. And here's a different story. And I feel like what this does for me is it's, I always talk about it being like technicolor. You know, I think about the old, old school television when it was, you know, black and white. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I saw in black and white, you know, because there's a lot of things that, you know, you miss the detail. It's certainly not 4K or 8K, you know, television. It's really kind of grainy, not very high resolution, but I kind of get the gist of it in general. You start drilling in this stuff, folks, and it's infinite resolution is what it really is. And what we're seeing is this deeper resolution. You say, hold on a second. Well, <clears throat> if this lie is to essentially gain authority over you and to control you, <clears throat> well, what, what do we want to do? I want to make you ineffective. And so we, we started this whole thing with, hey, why are we here? What's the purpose of us being here? And I think that, you know, a lot of new agey people, it's really interesting, actually, how all of these things kind of point to the same thing, ultimately. The new agey people get this whole idea of manifesting and that you've got power and that the divine is in you. And you see all these people that I think a lot of the church folk would say, OK, these are crazy people who live in Santa Fe. And these people smell like patchouli oil and don't bathe very often. And so they judge that. But when I see these pieces of what are they saying to each other? And it's interesting from a different perspective or saying, hey, you know, you're you're special. You're divine. You are these things. You manifest your future. And it's interesting that they've come to that from a very different angle than reading the Hebrew. No. But when you when you see the picture of all of these things, right, the, the heavens declare, you look into creation. I mean, it's in everything, right? Almost screaming at us the order of creation. But then I brought up to you this whole idea of collapsing the waveform, right? The very nature of who we are in our observation. So if I turn my back to the double slit, I'm not observing it. But if I observe it, and I can do that observing from anywhere on planet Earth. Do you mm -hmm. know that? I can focus my attention. Somebody could say to me, there is a double slit experiment happening in London. And this is what it is. I want you to focus on that and you can collapse that waveform. You don't have to be looking at it physically. Hmm. And what's amazing about this, the detectors and all of these things that are happening with creation is there's an obvious, I think, inherent knowledge that we are different than the animals. And I like to keep it really simple. You know, if I got to build a shed, I don't rely on my dog to do it. My dog just doesn't seem to be able to handle a hammer very well. <laughs> and strangely enough, I, I tell my dog the the plans and just wants to, you know, chase a squirrel or bark. And I'm like, why isn't this dog getting this stuff? Right. And what's different about us? And then, of course, when you then dive into this story of creation, what is amazing to me is that if Yahweh of the Elohim came here, right? that the design and the purpose of the entire creation and the Yahweh of the Elohim, when he came, he called the singular God Father. There is this amazing, not hierarchy in sense of magistrates and judges, but one of family. And at the core of that family is love. And what is so amazing to me about this is you can take it from so many different angles. But what's so reassuring to me is the fact that the purpose of this creation has roles, and in those roles are purpose. And so if we are one of the Elohim class, of which Jesus is the authority, right? He is the in the line of Melchizedek, right? He is the top dog. He's the boss, 
right? Listen to him. Hey, reminder, listen to him, that you can listen to him now. And so the question I would say to you and what I'm asking myself daily is, should I go my own way or should I ask him? Well, every time I've asked him, in many cases, it hasn't been for my own strength that things happen because it's ordered in the strategic order in which he designed it to be. And so when I think about this, lean not on your own understandings. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Well, what's the straightest, straightest path? The straightest path is listening and doing what he says. And the greatest amount of life that comes is this fullness of being aligned properly with the order and rank of creation. And what's interesting about it is when we have this choice, we can't be like him. We can't be Elohim if we don't have the ability to make the choice. So there is this element, it seems like, of discipline. Because for me, it's like a constant reminder. Well, now I look at the Sabbath and I look at all these things. And I'm like, oh my goodness, he's been telling this in so many different stories. Even to the point where he tells an agricultural story and everybody goes home except a group of people who run after him. And they say, hey, what did you mean by that story? Ah, because you have chased me down, I will tell you. This is, folks, if you knew that there was this thing called chat GPT, right? And you had to produce something. You could, you know, you could do it the hard way, your own way, or you could go to chat GPT and have some help. Now there's a debate on the ethics of that. That's such a derivative of this idea of saying, what if I wanted to become aligned with the very purpose of why I was created? And what I've discovered is that when I align myself and I do and ask and do the things he tells me to do. Meaning I open, I, I walk through open doors, Steve. I don't kick doors down. I don't go my own way in that sense. I'm sure I do, but he redeems all those things too. But if I think about this order and this path, if the Supreme One who created this is outside of time, it's already done. Yeah. It's already complete. And I say, okay, well, why would he want us to experience this in the nature of time and in this process? Well, because he loves us, but it also makes me wonder, well, it's really short. I looked at my dad in the casket and I'm like, man, this sucks. So what value is it? And so I'm going to ask you that question. What value is this portion of life, right? So I look at my dad, right? All kinds of really interesting decisions my dad made. He was born into a certain culture, you know, post raised by depression era parents, Right where kids were to be seen and not heard. My dad got into the whole 60s white paper, man. Like, he he lived it out. Mm -hmm. And that got passed on to me. And there's some good things and there's some bad things and some challenges. And he's 71 years old and he sits in the church and the pastor brings in a cinder block. And my dad has this, like, the Lord speaks to him through a cinder block. And it transforms him. And But did he know, well, in the Hebrew, the Elohim is plural. My dad had no concept of the Elohim <laughs> word being plural. Okay? Well, we didn't care. And I think that's important. It's important to recognize that, too. And I think of aborted children, and I think of, you know, three-months-old babies who die of cephalitis or whatever, right? They're, he's accounted for all of these things. The question is, if you're actually paying attention to this and you're actually watching this and you're actually listening to these things and it's actually resonating with you, that's a part of the, the understanding to say, hold on, this is becoming a part of my own story of understanding that he's calling me to these things. And so I have been wired to chase after him. And what is strange about that is when you drill into the words, what is the ecclesia? It's not the church, folks. It's those who are chasing after him. Well, in a way, I almost feel like he designed me to chase him. Yes. He designed me for that purpose. The three-month-old baby who died was not even able to walk. Yeah. My dad, in this situation, almost prepared the way for me. Do we, 
you know, and I think one of the things in our own going our own way is we were like, Steve, I got to save everybody. And people get this idea that they do that work. Yeah. That they're the ones who do the saving. And we get this idea that, well, yeah, like this stuff is really profound stuff. But understanding the very nature of the word Elohim and it's plural and all this stuff. I don't know that it's meant for everyone. And I don't mean that in the wrong way. I mean it in this way. If it resonates, it was meant to resonate. Push back on that if that's wrong thinking. Well, well no, it's not. It's not at all. I, and this is going to be a little bit graphic, but I was in. Uh, I was playing baseball at a junior college, uh, Cerritos Junior College, which was the premier junior college program in the country. Um, and there was this tall, lanky left-hander who had a delivery very similar to a Frank Tanana kind of talent. And we were in the we were in in the shower after a game one time. He pitched a great game, and I said, you know, um, I said, hey, you know, if you keep this up, and you know, you continue to really work on this, I have no doubt you could be a major league pitcher someday. And he looked at me just straight eyed and says, what makes you think I have any interest in being a major league pitcher? Now for me, that, that, that was, how can you even think that? How right. Can That's everything. You answer. <laughs> you know? okay. And so the, the idea behind the whole thing is, this is where the attribute of the Elohim that we see expressed all day long that we don't really recognize where it comes from is that element of choice. You cannot rule if you don't have the, can't exercise choice. And so we, we have a very simplistic way of looking at choice, which is fine. You know, what it is very simply is that why do we have the, prerogative of choice. Why do we do this? By the way, that's where we started last week. The mm -hmm. why. We're focused on the what and hows. Jesus is interested in us, in us asking him why. Why? Because the whys give the meaning and purpose to the what and hows. Yep. And so just say plainly what you are getting at. Hornet, UK, you be the man. Okay. Here it is. You are an Elohim. You are not an animal. You have been designed to rule the entirety of God's creation with him. Not on your own. Not on my own. With him. And there is one who's trying to use your authority to rule to serve its interests rather than God's interests. And so if you're interested yep. in learning how to penetrate that, how to break that grip and move in the other direction, by the way, that's the whole upside down, right side up thing. Yep. Okay. So say it plainly, you're an Elohim. Go ask Jesus what that means and then enjoy the ride. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Like that's That encompasses everything. And in Hornet UK, I really appreciate you asking that question. Absolutely. Because I've been asking that question for the last six months of Steve is like, hold on a second. Cause one of the wonderful things about you, Steve, is you're asking amazing questions and you're patient enough to let me get there. I'm like, well, why don't you just make it plain to me? Here's the thing I think is cool. One of the, th the disciplines that Steve has that I've recognized that I, I really admire, he's not asking you to follow him. No. There's so many people out there that are trying to build some sort of audience and be your guru. Steve is not a guru. And I, it's been proven to me over the last, that's the reason I keep talking to him, honestly. If he was like, hey, you need to do what I tell you to do, and I figured it all out, and I'm the smartest guy, and I'm a prophet, that is the last thing that Steve has ever would ever say. And what I really admire about this is, hey, I've just spent the last 40 years asking Jesus myself about these things, and he's been blowing my mind constantly. That's why I always come back to this fact. And it's, to me, the, the, the greatest thing I've ever learned from you, Steve. Jesus is alive and he speaks. 
That's it. That's it. That's absolutely it. And that's where it all begins, too, is this idea that do you actually believe? And we've talked about this in many other episodes, this this idea that, um, well, Steve, yeah, I I mean, I I believe in God and, you know, Jesus. Yeah, I, I get that stuff. And yeah, I went to church and all this stuff. But are you saying that there's real power and that he would actually speak to me? Well, I feel like I've asked him, Steve, and he doesn't like come out and say, hey, Matt, let me tell you about this. And he doesn't speak the way like a person speaks. And so this term even to speak isn't a big enough word to define what it is. And so I experience things differently than you do, Steve. And so I actually want to, here's a great example. We talked for three hours yesterday, Steve and I did. And we went to town. It was awesome. We talked about everything from baseball to the Anunnaki. It was awesome. (laughs) And it was, it was crazy. But you know what was interesting is that Steve has cultivated in who God has made you to speak to you in a certain way, and you come to learn to identify that over time. And you know what's interesting is a lot of times where I have you know this thinking for me, I think there's some commonalities between how we engage with Jesus, but I think that there's also some functional differences. For example, I do find that I am, I tend to be alone without dis, without distraction. I find if there are commonalities, strangely, often in the shower um, is an amazing time for me. Like a really weird, like a lot of things come to me in the shower. Why? I, I'm not saying it's because of the shower or water. I'm just saying that for me is a time. The other is when I'm walking. It's interesting, like actually walking and I'm, early in the morning and nobody's around there's stories and pictures and images and animals and all these things that speak and it's not an audible voice and i think that that's one of the challenges of all this stuff is when i say jesus is alive and he speaks well i'm expecting him to talk in english and you know come out from a cloud and speak and that's the confusing part of this is that if he is a father and we're a son, he's going to accomplish what he intends to accomplish. So the question is, are we consulting him in every possible, at every possible turn? And that's where I feel like it has real value to me, is that I'm told by everybody. Like, And, and of course, I lead a lot of people right now in my work, and everybody's got an opinion. And, I, and I'm very comfortable listening to all. I love new ideas and all this kind of stuff. But I have to filter them through this, all right, Lord. You know, and a lot of times for me what it is, is I don't have peace about something. Somebody's like, hey, we need to do this, and we need to do this, and it needs to be like this. And I'm just like, it's not that I don't understand it. I understand what you're getting at. But I'm also going, why do I not feel like and have this sense of peace about this. Well, I go to him and I go, hey, help me understand that. And when generally, it's so counterintuitive. He's like, oh, yeah, you're unlocking something. Well, hold on. I mean, I've asked him about medical procedures. I've asked him about lists and what I've forgotten. And as you continue to cultivate that, it's real, it's real value and it's a navigation. But I know I haven't been doing it for 40 years. But there's a possibility, Steve. Is it correct in me saying there's a possibility that he'll speak differently to me than he does to you? Well, absolutely. I mean, you're you're Matt. He designed you to do certain things. He designed you to think in order for you to do things in that certain way with him. You have to be wired to do that. So. So, yes, the way he deals with you is going to be unique to me because we're two totally different people assigned to two totally different roles, all within the same vision of bringing about the father's reason for creating, which is that we would rule with him in the fullness of his nature and character with him. See, we can't rule apart from him. What did Jesus say? He said, listen, 
and I've had friends, me being me included, how long it took me to get this simple thing. You cannot do one thing apart from me. Now think about that. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. You can't do one thing. Well, does that mean I can't go out and do a bunch of activity? No, it just means that whatever you do is going to return to dust eventually. So in the context of eternity, it's not one thing. It never, it's as if it never existed. It just disintegrates into nothingness. Why? Because that has no life in it. See? It has no life in it. And so, you know, it's a it's fascinating to me, Matt, that how we are trained to get on board with conforming to a certain standard of behavior when the father says, I'm going to conform you to the very essence of my son. Once I do that work in you, you will be indistinguishable from my son because you will be my son. See, we are doing this so that many sons can come into this. Many daughters can come into this. This is not for one person or one group of people. This is for anyone and everyone who is interested. Steve, are you interested? If you are, then come on, let's do this thing. I think you'll enjoy it once you get going. It's going to be a little rough in the beginning because, you know, there's going to be some stuff that's going to have to be unwound. Don't worry about that. I got your back. This is all going to come together. Yeah, you're going to be confused sometimes. You're not going to understand what the heck's going on. It's all part of the process. Don't worry about that. We're just untangling some knots from last week, right? We're just untangling some knots. But once these, as each of these knots gets untangled, you are going to see things in the way that they are, not in the way you've been told they are. Right. And they are very different. Steve, you interested? That's all I'm asking of you. Are you interested? Yep. No more, no less. Well, and and that's so, and so that's that's part of it. So how he works with me is going to be entirely different than the way he works with you. And yet, when we get together, we'll see some a lot of the co- same common themes and ideas that and realities that result from that. That's what's so flipping cool. It is. And you know what's interesting, too, is we're not the first people to do this, <laughs> no. right? We're not the first. And that's what I think is really cool is I've looked over history. I'm really interested in kind of church history and these type of things. And, you know, it is so clear in our culture and in past, all of the desires of the of evil forces to divide us, right, into to create wedges and, and, you know, make us hate each other. And there's, you know, I, I, I'm coming to see this. I watched this, um, this documentary of what is a woman last night by, um, I forget what his name is. Matt Walsh, I think is his name. And it was, you know, this controversial video that was banned on Twitter and then it was opened up and supported by, uh, Elon Musk. And it was kind of sad to me, right? It was, it was sad to me in a way because, it reinforced division, right? I understand why they wanted to create it, right? And I understand why, you know, people want to push back on activists and these extreme things. But here's the thing that I think is interesting. So commonly right now, you know who Andrew Tate is? This guy who's like, you know, the alpha male guy. Every high school boy in America knows who Andrew Tate is. Hmm. And I think about all the people that I see in crypto and that I run into and Hex and Pulse and all this stuff. What we're so commonly designed to do here is one, hey, you're just an animal. Okay. And people have the information you need. And so you need to find the person who's killing it. Well, Andrew Tate, look at him. He's got the muscles and he's strong and he's got the money and he's got the ladies and he's got whatever. And so we, because we're told, that you're just an animal and this is about as good as it's going to get. And there is no God. There's no future after this. When the lights go out, it's over. 
and that the structure of this is we're just wandering and alone. Let's look at the people who are being successful and let's emulate them. Let's go and be like them. Oh, yeah, well, I got to learn the, the 12 rules for this and the 16 rules of power. And I need to know how to negotiate and I need to do this and I need to do that to manipulate the situation which is all a part of this construct to say, yes, I'm just going to keep you busy. And in the process, hate everyone you come into contact with. It's not like your particular guru of the month. And so we rest on our own understandings and the teachings of men. Well, this is science and this person has their tenure at Harvard. I don't care. You have access to the one who created it all. And that's the big lie here. Right. I mean, what was it from the usual suspects? The greatest, you know, thing the devil ever did was convince people he didn't exist. And if you think about this, you have access. Even Jesus said, you will not worship on this mountain, but in spirit and in truth. You will. There will become as a day when you have access to me. And the Holy Spirit comes and reminds you of these things. And then I give you the Sabbath. And then we re like reminder, reminder, reminder. And I think, you know, all of these things that come to mind, like my yoke is easy, my burden is light, this idea that, hold on, could I have peace in any and every situation? If I was tortured, could I have peace? Yeah, yeah. Would it really? And even if I'm on the cross being judged for my sin because I stole or whatever, I acknowledge you, right? The thief on the cross next to Jesus, and I go, wow, you are who you say you are. Well, today you'll be with me in paradise. And I look at all these stories, and then when you start reading the stories that weren't in, originally available for people to quote-unquote read, but were told these stories, it's like, oh, in alignment of this, if we are actually sons of God, right? If we are actually, well, then we have the attributes and likeness and image of him, then we have the power of him. And it says in the Word... The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And then I see what some of the disciples did after he had left. It's like, whoa, you'll do greater things than I. You're more than conquerors. And I go, what? We've been told that we're just pieces of crap, and we're just animals that mean nothing. Hold on, are you saying that, yeah, well, within me, you follow me. This is the fullness of life. And so... What I'd love to kind of wrap this up with is this talk of the kingdom come, okay? Yeah. So I feel like a big cap on this would be you're here for a reason, your purpose. You have been given authority, but you've also been given choice. And if you remain in him, get ready. It's going to be good. Now, what is the purpose of his creation? And he said when he taught us to pray— on earth as it is in heaven. What is the kingdom of God, and what is our role in it? Yeah, for sure. The, first of all, it's a fabulous question to ask Jesus about because it's another example of how virtually everybody who hears this stream, they will have their their own kind of influence in, in that question. So here's part of it. First of all, the kingdom of God is first an attitude. See, it's, it's, not, it's not just a place. A, like a location? It, well, there's a location, it's a place, it's, a, it's an environment, all those things. But what the place is really just a device, if you will. The planet Earth is just a device. It's a place, it's a device, and the devices are always neutral. And so what is it that gives, uh, that animates that, that device is the nature and character that is driving it, that saturates it, that, is, that gives its meaning and intention. So the kingdom of God is first, where the nature and character of God resides. And in each individual and situation, there is an intention to 
and an attitude. It's not a lawful following rules kind of thing. It is just an attitude that, sa that says, and that is one with him. Now, here's what, now out of that oneness then becomes the manifestation, if you will, of all things that are him. Hmm. Made for him, by him, you know, all the things that you just described. See? So well, the first part of the answer is coming to this realization that it's not first a place, it's an attitude. And this attitude then produces the place. Okay. Adam and Eve would have considered Eden heaven. It possessed all the characteristics of heaven. What was it that ruined heaven on earth? Perversion. That which was, per that which was perverse ruined what was perfect. Well, guess what then reverses the perversion? The perfect. And what did Jesus say? He said that the Father said, be perfect as I am perfect. Well, how am I perfect? In him. I intend no ill will. I intend only blessing and benefit. I invite, I don't impose. Okay? I Come and join me. See, this thing is pretty doggone cool. Think about this for a minute. If we grew into the nature and character of God, would we intend ill will on another party? No. Would we intend to exploit another party? No. Nope. Would we intend to harm another party? No. Nope. Would we intend to help another party? Yes. Okay. If we did that, what would earth look like? Kind of like heaven. Ah. My kingdom come. My will be done. Where? On earth. On earth. Is it is in heaven. So guess what? Learn how to do that. So, okay. So this is awesome, Steve. This is just wonderful. So I'm going to just say this to anybody that's listened to this. Okay. Insert your name here. Right. This is you. Steve, you said to me, you go, hey, Matt, if you were in charge of X, Y, Z. Yeah. So let's just say Jack Handy or Drix or Bearded Saint or Hornet UK one or whatever it is. Insert your name here. If you were in charge of X, would you be corrupt? Would you be destructive? Would you lord over? Would you um, would you impose? Would you hurt? Would you all these things that you just described? In that is a choice. Yeah. And it's interesting to say, and Paul said it so many times, he's like, even the things that I want to do, I like I'm I'm burdened by this, right? Like I, I'm I know I there's certain things I shouldn't do, and I'm like I'm like drawn to it. And it's it's interesting that this idea of corruption. I'm capable of it. And that's the thing, Steve, that I recognize in myself. I check myself all the time. It's like, especially being the founder of a cryptocurrency. It's like, I remember when I was making crazy money and playing golf three times a week and drinking too much after golf and driving home. I remember those days. I'm like, I know I'm making the wrong choice here. I didn't have to pay the penalty for that, but it could have been really bad. And I'm like, then I look at all of these warnings, right? And all of these, all you know, Sermon on the Mount. I, I look at all of these things. I'm like, he's constantly reminding us in like 50 different examples of how careful and cautious we ought to be and how connected we need to stay because it's so easy to go astray. You know, that's why I talk about people having all this abundance, right? Wow, the blockchain, if we animate this for good, boy, this could un unlock so much resources. But I also recognize that with that responsibility, those resources comes choice. Yeah. And some people will not choose wisely. And it's dangerous in some respects. Can, can I speak to that just a yeah, little bit? Yeah, I'd love in to. The, in the context of your the question um, you ask 
you asked earlier about people's different levels of of interest. Yeah. Um, and the unique way that that God deals with each of us so that it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing. There is an introduction and then say, man, go find out the deal for yourself. Yeah. You, you'll be glad you did, but hang in there. It'll be a little hairy for a while. <laughs> and this whole thing about, about crypto is the same thing exists to some people. Crypto is anathema. Wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pool pole. Some people think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Everything in between, okay? Some people look at crypto as an, as an investment opportunity. Some people look at it as a means of, of trying to break free of the perversions that are going on, um, you know, in the economic systems of the world, primarily in the United States, you know, the IMF, all this other stuff. Let's break free of centralized finance. You you talk all the time about the merits of DeFi and the and the difficulty of centralized finance. On and on. See, there's all kinds of levels of of where a person can see their level of interest within this nearly infinite partitioning of this one concept of cryptocurrency. That's really good. And then there are those who say, hey, I'm interested in cryptocurrency because I see God getting ready to, to build a new economic order. Huh. Guess what? Everybody has a place to play within that spectrum. Yeah. And it doesn't make anybody better or worse than anybody else, because in the kingdom of God, it's not about that kind of merit. It's about fitting where you belong. That's exactly what Jesus was saying to John's, James and John's mother. Jesus, I would like you to do something for me. Okay, what do you got in mind? Grant in your kingdom that one of my sons will sit at your right, and, and the other of my sons will sit at your left. What a fascinating answer. Woman, you don't even know what you're asking. Now, in the context of this, you know, uh, the title of our streams here, you're, you li you're living in the upside down world. And in the upside down world, what, what you see hierarchy provides you with privilege. Mm. That's not how hierarchy works in my kingdom. See? So you don't even know what you're asking. More to the point, that's not even mine to give. Now think about this one. The one to whom all authority was given by the Father said, it's not mine to determine where a person occupies, what role a person occupies in my Father's kingdom. That's his prerogative alone. Wow. Okay. So what's the what is the invitation there? The unspoken invitation. Dot 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 dot. So what I encourage you to do is ask the father what your role is and what role he might have for your sons. And by the way, my suggestion is to have them ask too. Yeah. Because there's a place. See? This is my place. Where is your place? See? And each and every pop, each and every person, and in their place is essential to the proper functioning and accomplishment of the Father's vision. And how astounding is it that he would choose, back to the back to the creation thing, that he would choose to make the fulfillment of his vision dependent on people being willing to participate. The religious mind doesn't have the capacity con to consider that because they see God is out there being all by himself. Well, when he was the first, he was already by himself, right? Yeah. In that, in that kind of thinking. 
So he chose to do something different. Okay, well, let's find out what that is and maybe think about participating in it, you know, and, and, and do that for a while. I mean, think about that just in the concept of, you know, in the whole crypto thing, you know, he's going to build a whole economic order. Yeah. Whoa, dude. Well, it's going to look like. Well, and for those who have ears to hear, you know, I I think about those who chased after him and wanted to know what the agricultural story meant. It had value in itself. The story has value. Yes. But as they ran after him, see, that's where I feel like I'm at with crypto is everybody's worried about P hex versus E hex and all this kind of stuff. And I go, hold on a second. It's been revealed to me that this is much, much greater and the implications of this is much, much greater than what you think it is. I see it in the context of what God is doing in the world. And I see clearly that in this process of provision, like he provides in the midst of the storms. And, you know, there is a talk of a future in which there is a one world currency. But you know what? There is no currency in the place of love. Right. There's no currency in the place of love. So if we understand that value is transacted and that it's transferred, right, that you and I talking is actually value transfer. Yeah. Right. You investing your time is a form of love and care. That's not divisible by dollar bills. And I think what people have often thought about is that this economic value. No, no. All of these things of value. What is peace? How much is it worth? Like how many, how many stable coins is peace worth? And so that's, you know, that's something that I'm just, and, and here's something I'd say to people, because I, you know, I came to know, I, I came to understand that God had power and I had a purpose in my life that he had a plan when I was 28. Okay. I, I before that had no real context of what I thought it was phony stuff. I thought it was hokey. But he revealed to me actual power. And he's since then continued to up the stakes and show me even more power. But sometimes that power isn't me slashing through something with a sword. It's actually the rest I'm able to experience. And that this value is so multifaceted that it's like so many people I know and in are self-medicating so many people i know are so disturbed with anxiety with depression with just worry and so burdened and they're suffering in silence and i'm just i i'm here to testify there's real power here there's real power here and all i think you're saying steve and what i totally agree with is it's just a function of your interest right hey there is, there is a God who created it all, and his son, who's been given all authority, would love to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Right and on. I think about the six-year-old Steve. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. And you're like, where's he at? I'm in. Oh, I'm, I'd love to meet him. <laughs> and that's the invitation, which is so great. But I think what's so nice about this, folks, don't take any of this stuff as like, well, we're trying to convince you of something so you'll follow us. No, I'm, I've experienced incredible amount of fruit from all of this stuff. But what it really boils down to is I got a friend in Steve who's just constantly reminding me that Jesus is alive and he speaks and I can go and ask him. And if something's troubling you and you're like, I don't know how I feel about this. And, and I saw this comment from Hornet UK1, which I really appreciate. It's like, you said we are the Elohim, but I don't know what that means. They have bodies. Are they basically about the Anunnaki theory, which is so funny that that was our conversation yesterday. <laughs> Here's the cool thing. Don't listen to us. Ask him yourself. What do you mean by this Elohim thing? What is this? When these guys talk about this stuff, are they, are they crazy? Are these guys nuts? Are these guys, is this, is this right or is this wrong? And you will get confirmation of that in one way or the other. And it's like, are you interested in knowing for yourself? Go to the source. Don't come to the derivatives. We're just derivatives of all this. We're experiencing this stuff. And, you know, you've been on the planet longer than I have, Steve, and you've been doing this and walking this way longer than I have. And it's like, we don't have it figured out, but there are some things that we have discovered and they've been reinforced by 
literally the power of God in our lives. It, it is manifested with, there is an incentive to it. There is fruit that is the result of it. And a lot of times, Steve, it's just peace for me. Yeah. A lot of times the currency of God for me is just like rest. And it's it's most profound when things are like, you know, the waves are high and the wind is fast. And I'm like, well, why are you so calm? You should be freaking out like everyone else. No, I don't know. I, I strangely, I kind of, it's a peace that transcends all understanding. I don't know how to describe it, but why do I have peace in the midst of the storm? That's the power. And I go, it's available. And it's going to be, you're going to experience it differently. You're going to articulate it differently. But I can't tell you how many times I've called Steve or other people and said, hey, hey, man, this thing happened. And I'm like, I don't have the words to even describe what it means to me, Steve. And you're like, yeah, I know what you mean, but let's try. Let's try to, to articulate because it's amazing. And that's worship to me. Right? He's like, wow, look what he did. Unbelievable. And you're like, yeah, Matt, I know you don't have the words for it, but it sounds really cool. And I just appreciate that. And that's this whole thing of community, too. Well, Hornet is, is obviously incredibly, what I would say, interested. Yeah. Um, and just, and to respect, to respect your question, which is a great one, Elohim is a class of beings that possess certain prerogatives that are unique to that class. Okay? And so included in that in that class of in included in the prerogatives of that class is the ability to rule now let's take that by contrast with the angelic class they and we haven't even gotten there the angelic yeah. class does not possess the authority to rule they possess the authority to minister. They are part of the ministering class. So they have the authority to minister. That's what the messenger component of it is. They are ministering on behalf of the father, conveying his words specifically to Gideon standing there, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord saying, hey, man of great esteem. What's around him? What are you talking about? Well, dude, actually, what are you talking about, man of great esteem? I'm ha hiding out in a cave here trying to hold on to the little bit that I've got because these Midianite dudes over here, they're, they're heisting in, you know, everything I've got. What do you talk about, man of great esteem? You know, I don't have an ounce of it. I know that's why the father sent me. Wow. You and that's Gideon, right? That's Gideon. Are. Yes, Gideon. You need to understand who you are. Mm. You're not a slave. See? Yeah, you're in a time of discipline right now. But listen, you need to understand who you are. You are a man of great esteem. Jehovah has sent me to actually convey this to you. Now go in this, your power to accomplish what I've given you to do. Go kick Midian's butt, and let's restore order. And I'll give you the and I'll give you the power to do it. Yeah. Wow. Beginning with understanding who you are, folks. We are not animals. Yeah. We are not lower than the angels. We are not pieces of trash. We certainly act like that, but we're doing exactly the way we've been trained to act. Hey, okay. no. Just hook up, Jack. I spent at least 28 years running from the truth. Yep. Man, doesn't that describe so many of us? Yep. What I would submit to you is you weren't running from the truth. You were, run you were running from what was presented to you as the truth. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. But once you found it, you stopped running. Amen. See? And that's the way it is. You stop running. Give a man a glimpse of my kingdom and you never have to motivate him again, Steve. Just give him a glimpse. Okay? And those who are interested in peeping through that little hole in the wall, you'll know them because their face will be glued right against that little peephole. 
And they'll say, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I can't even see what you're talking about, but I'm sure trying. I'm sure interested. That's all we need because they're showing interest. Yep. Okay? And I'm, and I am attentive to those who are interested. Just ask me. Yep. Whoa, dudes. <laughs> it's easy. Mm -hmm. Simple. Well, and that's, I yeah. didn't hear that in Sunday school. It's custom tailored to you. This ain't off the shelf, folks. This is a custom tailored journey for you. And it's amazing to me. I think one of the reasons I thought things were so hokey for so long, Steve, was that it was almost like somebody was trying to stuff me into a preformed box. Yes. And they were they were presenting Jesus as a box. Yeah. And we're going to stuff you into this. Yeah. And you're like, well, this doesn't fit me, and this hurts, and why are you stuffing me here? And this this isn't right. And you know it intrinsically, this idea. Like, when I was a kid, there was all this pressure from the youth group that I would go down front, right? Because I think that they were like, for them, as many kids as we can convince to go down front is our treasures in heaven, right? Yeah. Like, we're going we're gonna to get notches on our belt if we can get these kids. So I was pressured to do it. Well... I wanted to be accepted by the people within the church and the girls that were there. And I was a young kid. I'm like, well, I guess they want me to do this. And if I do this, I'll, I guess I'll fit in more. But I didn't have interest in it. It wasn't, it wasn't of my own desire. It was because, hey, and so it had no power. And then I was so disillusioned since I was 12 till 28 going, this is horse beep, right? It's just, this is not... This is not real. And you know what's amazing is as I showed interest and was, you know, you know, pursued it, I realized, hold on a second. One thing I'm confident of, he's used some of the most amazing set of circumstances to get people's attention. Yeah. And sometimes they're really dramatic, and sometimes they're very natural, calm progression. And it's like it's custom tailored for you folks. And it's and it's neat because you're going directly to the source. And it and to cap this off, because we're over two hours now, is imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. I I love I love how crypto is an analogy, especially the kind of crypto we're in. I love the fact, you know, and Richard Hart talks about this too, is this idea of what is the purpose of cryptocurrency? And it was invented to remove counterparties and to to remove middlemen and to be censorship resistant and what is the censorship but an outside force changing it yeah Redefine. and so when you think about this this invention of this immutable contract on the blockchain which is this distributed ledger le, uh, ledger what's really amazing about this is such a picture of this when we all agree to not take control of all of it for ourselves, we ensure that it is right. So there's an agreement. That's the consensus mechanism. All You have one job to do. Make sure this is correct and check with everybody else. Is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Right? Every millisecond we're checking to see that the ledger is correct and everybody's got the same version. And if somebody has a different version, they get kicked out. Always the same. Always the same. Always the same. But then what's really interesting about it is you have a wallet with keys. And it's so interesting that let's just imagine, I'm just going to use this analogy in this. You have wallet with keys, folks. And those keys unlock something. What do they unlock? Your ability to do business with the immutable, with the thing that is true. We agree that this ledger is true. Why? Because there's so many people out there who are checking, checking, checking to make sure it doesn't change. True. Why? Because if it's true, we can rely and trust it. Yeah. And so we use our keys to unlock this deal. But somebody tells us, they're like, hey, man, let me tell you about Texan. Let me tell you about Hex. Let me tell you about Pulse or Pulse X. And let's use Hex as an example of this because there's a lot of hexagons who understand it. Knowing about Hex, knowing about the immutable contract, knowing that it's on the blockchain, knowing that it exists... And holding T-shares are two different things. Because you can't hold the value that's in the contract without engaging with it directly. Mm. 
you cannot borrow the power of God from Steve or me. You can't. You can hear us talk about it. You can learn about it. You can, you can go, how oh, that sounds really nice. But you can't have T-shares and own the tokens unless you personally, with your keys, engage with the immutable contract on the blockchain. So knowing about Hex and holding T-shares in your, in your wallet are two totally different things. The yeah. question is, do you want the benefits of holding T-shares? I mean, it's like the same story. Do you yeah. want the benefits of holding on to Jesus? Well, what does that mean? Well, it's transformative. It's got power. You're Elohim. You have a role and responsibility. And so your alignment with the very purpose of what you were created for becomes apparent. And then you stop. This is what happened to me, Steve. I stopped. You said it like you, Jack's like, I've been running away for it. Yeah. People literally said to me after my, you know, conversion and this um, unbelievable realization, they're like, you never could sit still before. Mm. They're, like, they're like, something's different about you. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I'm just not frenetic anymore. I'm mm -hmm. not constantly. And I think a lot of times I was just worried what everyone was thinking and trying to dance like a monkey to try to be the thing that everybody wanted me to be. Yeah. I was not comfortable in my own skin. So the implications of all this stuff, it's just so far reaching. But what I love about it is it almost feel like Jesus goes right to the heart of everything. Yeah. Right. And it's wonderful because that's this, you know, transformation that we experience and it's, it's real power. And then also, I think it's so cool. Like I shook your hand and I knew. Isn't that funny? Like everything I learned in the first moment of meeting you has become true. I knew it when I talked to you. I knew it in the intonation of your voice. I knew it in the shaking of your hand. Why? Because he confirmed that for me. That's cool. It's the kingdom of God. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Well, I, I've had some weird stuff happen to me too, man. Well, that's for another time. And we have our next topic too, because we, we you know, in the next topic for the next time is going to be the angelic class. So we covered Elohim class, and then let's talk about angelic class next time. Sound good? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Anything final comments from you, Steve? Um, hey, would, the last couple have been a little bit heady in, yeah. in, in certain areas. And, and I just appreciate the folks who are willing to engage with us on this. Because what's really happening is there is a systematic demolition of this mechanism of error that's causing those who are really interested to getting off course. And I was one of them. You know, so I'm not talking about when we talk, I don't talk about anything as if somebody's doing anything wrong or getting crazy. And that's not one of those woke kind of ideas. It's just that. No, man, we all, we're all coming out of the same stuff. Yeah. You know, so the only thing that's, that matters is if you're interested. And I really appreciate the interest that not only you show, but uh, so many of the folks who participate in these sometimes heady conversations. Um, I just appreciate their interest in hanging in there and, and uh, then taking it back to Jesus and say, what say you about this? Yep. There's some, some pretty bizarre things going on there. What say you? Oh, and that's what I'm doing, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. and of course, you know, I think about this. We talk about this publicly now. I feel like I went through this same process, yeah. you know, over the last six months prior to us sharing this stuff. And I'm still learning. Every time I do this, I learn something new or multiple things. Yeah. So I really appreciate you, Steve. And so do so many other people. Hornet UK says, God bless you. God love you. And may God hold us all in his almighty hands of love. Wow. Yeah, right on. Absolutely. Right on. Exactly. Right that's on. That's exactly where we are. Yep. Where else would you want to be? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Jack Handy, Hornet UK, Drix, 
Um, thanks y'all for for engaging in all this stuff. Crypto Pez says, please keep doing this stream forever. This is the best church ever, and I enjoy you both. Keep sharing this stuff. Love it. It's very encouraging to us to keep going. And you know what? Honestly, we get value having these conversations. You know, every time we have them, it's really, really cool. So, um, folks, thanks for joining this time. And Steve, thank you. I'll catch you in a minute. Very good. Thanks, folks. Have a great weekend. Once again, God sees you at the corner as I. Steve Sachs. Not only a professional baseball player, but a professional Jesus listener. Hey, that's kind of cool. I want to be a pro at that too. And so, you know, the more you see, the deeper this thing gets. And it's, um, the implications are tremendous, folks. But to bring it all back to crypto, this is a crypto channel. And every Friday I'm talking about Jesus. It's like, you know, not everybody wants to have that conversation. And I'm not scared to do it. But what I want you to understand is through all of this process that I've been going through, I've been realizing and I've had very, very clear direction that what we're a part of is consequential and consequential in this plan. We are animating the blockchain. How are we animating it? For good. So what does it mean to advocate for people's freedom and sovereignty and ability to transact, right? These things that we know are um, fundamental and we know that the one who is trying to distract and distort is creating his own version. He is using these and animating them for evil. CBDCs, social credit scores, digital IDs, all of these things, centralization of power. And it's just one component of this. But the question is, are you called into this ecosystem? Because really, it's the contribution of all of us together that actually animates it for good. It in and of itself, it's not like, well, Richard Hart's ecosystem, that's the good one. Well, it's only the good one because the people are animating it for good. It's a neutral one, but so is the CBDC. And we're seeing it being animated against us for control and for power. And the fact that there is provision for us to be able to come together in community, and that's what I love about this community, is a caring for one another um, in community. And to me, this is that fundamental thing. And so I think what God is doing in the world um, is being illustrated by attracting people to this potential shift and change in the, the money, the value, because we understand that that's important for us to accomplish things. But to think that we're a part of something that has much, much more impact in potentially I think, ultimately, making his name known. That its purpose isn't that you're rich. It's a, person that, it's a purpose that you would understand who he is. So that's the truth of the matter. That's why I do what I do. And so, once again, we have completed 20 hours of content with Steve Staggs right side up. If there's anything you gather from all this stuff is Jesus is alive and he speaks. Try them on for size. Thanks for joining the Pulse today. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat. We will catch you on the flip side. Don't mess with Texas.